please everybody stand up. So this talk is called Rails Traps. Um, and people kept saying to me, oh, what does that mean? So hopefully I'll explain that to you and hopefully you'll get some sense of um, what I go through for good and for bad. I do a lot of Rails training, Ruby training, teaching people, working with people, people who are new to language and to Rails. And I see them make a whole lot of mistakes, um, mistakes that they don't necessarily realize are mistakes um, that will bite them later on. And so hopefully this talk will give you a sense of some of those. Um, sort of what not to do. Uh, just a few words about myself. Um, I've been doing web development since uh, 93. I've been writing a column in Linux Journal every month, more or less. Almost always late, but my editor can attest to that, since 1996. Um, and I've been doing a lot of development, training, consulting, working with people, and over the last uh, seven years, it's mostly been in Ruby on Rails. Also do a lot of work with PostgreSQL. Um, but a lot of other open source technologies as well, both for people here in Israel uh, and abroad. Uh, and as I said, you know, development, teaching, training, there's a Ruby course opening next week. So those of you who don't know Ruby in this room, all right, maybe that's not a lot of you, you're welcome to join us. Um, also coaching, consulting, that sort of thing. So the first question is, what is a trap? Um, and this is a trap, right? Look at that yummy cheese. Oh, it looks so amazing. Oh, but if you get a bigger picture, if you look back a little bit, maybe that cheese looks good, but the things that are around it, the context is not so good. It does look really good, but it's not worth the long-term consequences because what happens if you go for that cheese? That's exactly right. The mouse gets stuck in the trap. So Rails traps are basically things that seem really good. They look like they'll benefit us right away, but at some point they're going to hurt. And so we should at least think about what we're going to do before we actually do it. And it doesn't mean that everything we do is going to be right. It doesn't mean that everything is going to be perfect. Um, but we should at least have some thought, put some thought into what we're going to do. And there is some overlap. You could even argue a fair amount of overlap between this and what are increasingly known as anti-patterns, right? Everyone learns about design patterns. Some people even use this knowledge. Um, but, and there's this interest now in sort of anti-patterns. What are things that you should not do? And uh, if you aren't familiar with it already, there's a good book called Rails Anti-Patterns. Clever name, yes. Uh, but it actually describes many, many, many things that people do wrong when they're establishing, uh, you know, putting together their Rails apps. So the first trap I want to describe is always using Rails. You know, there's this saying that if the only tool you have is a hammer, then every problem looks like a nail. And so there are people who are like, oh, you need a web app, thus you must use Rails. Um, and that is often true. Often true, but not always true. It's not the only framework. And I know this comes as a surprise. Ruby is not the only language out there. There are some others. Inferior, yes, perhaps, but they, they do exist. So you should use Rails because it's the right tool for the job. Well, what else could you use? Well, if we're going to stay in the Ruby community, of course, you know, my favorite is Sinatra. You know, I, I redid my company website a few weeks ago. I wanted something dynamic, but you know, how much of a database do you really need on my company website? Like, all we're doing is putting contact information and some glowing testimonials from clients. So really, I don't need anything more than something simple. So I'll go with Sinatra. It's still in Ruby. It still uses gems. It uses all the templates I like. It does all the things I want. Um, but it's much simpler, it's much smarter, uh, smaller, much faster to work with. And I even had someone call me last week and say, oh, I have this site that was done in PHP. It's about a week away from being done. I'd like you to rewrite it all in Rails. By the way, it needs to be ready in a month. Um, and I said, you know, maybe you should just stick with PHP for now and come back to us next time around for doing the next version. You know, these programming languages, these frameworks are tools, and saying Rails is the only way uh, goes over great if you are a member of the you know, Rails religion, but not necessarily if you're trying to get problems done. Uh, trap number two is ignoring Rails' opinions. So we love to say that Rails is opinionated software, right? Goes over very well in Israel, uh, where thing, people are strongly opinionated. You know, and, and what does that opinionated mean? That means files go in certain places, and the MVC split is very obvious, and active record, you know, the naming is set. And, you could change things. You are allowed to change all these defaults. And in all of my classes, people are like, but what if I want to, what if I want to? And the analogy I always use is, 
Don't be a salmon. Don't swim upstream, okay? It's just, it's gonna hurt. It's like I, I have three kids, and I sometimes say to them, we could do this the nice way or the not nice way. Um, <laughs> but in the end, it's going to happen, and what's gonna happen in Rails is you can do it the not nice way, but it's gonna hurt. It's gonna hurt you almost as much as it hurts Rails. So, yeah, you, you can change things. You, you can reconfigure Rails to conform to your opinions, but it's gonna pain you. It's gonna pain you now, and it's gonna pain you in the future. So really, if you can, stick with the defaults, keep it simple. So like, what do I mean? What are some examples? Well, you should always have a synthetic primary key on your database tables, and you should call it ID. Even if some other name might make sense, just keep it ID, it's gonna, be, it's gonna make so much more sense. And you keep to the naming conventions for your tables and your classes. You keep your models fat and your controllers skinny. You dry things up with filters and with callbacks. You know, all these things that Rails sort of gives you, all this goodness, Use it, take advantage of it. So trap number three is ignoring the logs. Here's a little tip for those of you who wanna hire a consultant. Look at the logs before you say that there's a problem. Like, I can't tell you how many calls I get from people. Such and such, you know, it doesn't work, right? Everyone's favorite bug report, it doesn't work. And I say, well, what does it say in the logs? Oh, I didn't think to check those. Um, and you look in the logs and it says, you have a problem on this line, or you didn't include this gem, or something along those lines. The logs are a gold mine, they're amazing, they're a developer's best friend. Check in the logs, and if you're having problems and you can't quite pinpoint it, it's great. You can use the logger object and write to the logs and write all sorts of things, and because the logger object uh, you know, writes, the different methods come with different levels, you can write certain things to development that will not get into production. You can even do vice versa if you really want. And you should also check the database log. If you're using a good database, you can, you can, you can configure the log file to have all sorts of amazing information there that will really, really make things clearer. Um, and a lot of people that I work with come from you know, these languages, these compiled languages like you know, C Sharp and Java, and so their first instinct is, aha, I have a problem. I know I'll fire up the debugger. And I'm like, no, no, no. Wait, check the log. There are other tools you can use. The debugger does exist. It's great. It works. And they're shocked when they hear that I fire up the debugger once a month, once every two or three months. This is not a primary tool of mine in my development. Similarly, another trap is ignoring the console. So all these people who come from languages with you know, fancy, fancy IDEs and everything, they're like, what? The console, I type to it, and it prints words back, and it's white on black. Okay, it can get a little fancier than that, right? We can get colorization, we get all excited about that. All right, but like basically you're typing to it, and I say, don't think this is primitive. This is you talking to your application. You're touching it, you're feeling it, you're working with it, you're getting to know it better. You can go onto the production server and really see what the objects are and how they work and what they're doing. And I see the console as a critical part of my development. Um, you know, there's no way that I would develop without the console open at the same time just to try things, test things out. What if I do this? It's my little experimental sandbox and it lets me feel my way through the application. So another trap is not being restful. Um, now, for years, Rails has said we should all be restful, right? Rest being that our uh, URLs point to different nouns, they point to different resources, and then we use the HTTP verbs to describe what we want to do with them. Right? So in the original versions of Rails, for those of us who were around when you know, that was released and dinosaurs roamed the earth, so this was the typical sort of um, route that you would have, where it was slash controller slash action. And it was great and it made sense, but over time Rails has evolved and we've evolved with it, perhaps even faster than it, to, to understand that this is perhaps not the best way to do it. Now you can use these sorts of routes, right? This still exists in the routes file, and you can uncomment and you can use it. But the thing is, you probably don't want to unless you really have to. You should think in terms of resources instead of controller actions, right? You should be thinking in terms of nouns and not verbs when you think about your URLs and what you're doing. Um, and these actions, really, it's quite surprising how often the seven standard methods, you know, the map to the different RESTful actions, can actually do a good job of describing what we want to do with our different objects. Now, what do you get in exchange for REST? Right? Well, then you're not as tired. <laughs> anyway, in exchange for REST, you get, it's okay, my children don't laugh either. 
Um, you get you know, convention over configuration. You get easier maintenance and understanding of the code because it's so much simpler. You get routes and forms and helpers that just work automatically. It's almost magical. Okay? You get scaffolds that work. And I know there are people who think that scaffolds are like evil incarnate in the Rails world. I really like them. Don't tell anyone. All right? But the other thing is that REST forces you to rethink the architecture of your application. It forces you to say, wait, what are the actual objects? What are the things I want to work with? And how do I want to manipulate them? Um, and that process of thinking, it's sort of like testing, right? It forces you to rethink how you're working and what you're doing. And that rethinking process is really useful. So the next trap is only being restful. <laughs> so right, like now that I've told you restful is great and you should really do that, there are times when it doesn't fit. And I've really met people who are like, oh, I wish that I could, I, I would love to write a new method to do this, but it doesn't fit into the restful framework. Well, th the fact is, Rails does give you the flexibility. It's pretty easy in your routes file to add either for a new member or for a new collection, a new method. And it's OK to do, so long as it's not the majority of your application. You know, if it's just a few here and there, that's OK. We understand. We can form a support group, you know? OK. Another thing is self-authentication. So I must say, one of the things that drives me crazy about Rails is that it doesn't have built-in authentication. That, you know, from the beginning, DHH said, I don't want to dictate how authentication works. I think, you know, the, the sort of the marketplace of gems should do it, the marketplace at that point of plugins should do it. And some, you know, the good things will rise to the top, as it were. I still think it would be great if there were at least some sort of framework for authentication that came within Rails. Um, the good news is that there are many frameworks for authentication that work with Rails. I have to use Devise a lot. It's very popular. There are others as well. But they exist. They exist out there. And yet, I still meet people on occasion who say, oh, I know. I'm going to create my own authentication scheme. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to implement it. Well, folks, security is really hard to do well. Um, and if you really want to risk your whole application security on like, you know, your ego or your insistence that you can do better authentication than other people, um, power to you. But I really think that you're going to find at some point it was not a good idea. I, I really think in general it's a good idea. Use something that already exists. It's been tested by usually hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of other sites. Um, you can use it. You can enjoy it. You can even you know, customize it. Next one, premature optimization. I think it was Dijkstra who said that premature optimization is the root of all evil. And if not, he's a pretty famous guy anyway and is worth quoting, even if it's not his quote. Okay? And so there are people who say, oh, I know. I'm going to be doing this application. We're going to have a billion users. Okay? So we should, from the get-go, we should start caching. We should index everything. We should get huge servers. I even had a client last year who said, I think we're going to have a few thousand users coming to us each day, and they're going to be in different groups. And I'm really worried about the, about the performance of checking what groups they're in. So I think we should use a bit mask. And that way, the database won't take up too much space. But we'll have one integer there and use the bit mask and find out what group they're in. Um, that might be a little premature, you know? And remember, Ruby, Ruby the language is not optimized for execution speed. It's optimized for programmer speed. Okay, and this is an important advantage. We want to work quickly, and quickly and well at that point. We want to be effective at what we do. And so we should not throw all of our eggs into the performance basket. We should think what we're doing, how we're doing it, make it easy to maintain our software. Because at the end of the day, computers are pretty cheap, but people are not. People are the expensive resource that we have in this industry. And so you want to maximize the efficiency of the people. And if you're going to, for instance, use a bit mask to figure out groups, that's probably going to slow down the programmers who later on have to maintain it. But it's not really going to change the performance of the application itself. Now, the other thing is, of course, let's say you do have some slowness in your application. When you do want to finally optimize it, don't just say, I think this part is slow. Actually, benchmark it. And there are so many ways to benchmark in Ruby and in Rails. There are different built-in possibilities for benchmarking, you know, modules and methods and classes that allow you to do it. You have third parties like New Relic that do a fantastic job of displaying it graphically for you and pinpointing the problems. Don't start optimizing until you've really figured out where the problem is. OK, another thing is database operations in Ruby. All right, now, when I say don't prematurely optimize, that is not me saying, please be stupid, right? <laughs> so being stupid is, hmm, I've got this database. It is optimized for retrieving data flexibly. It is written in C. 
I'm going to ignore that and do all of my work in a language that is relatively slow with very large objects. Okay, that, that's not what I'm suggesting that you do, but I see it done all the time. Remember that the data in the database is much, much smaller than the objects you're going to have an active record, not to mention the network traffic that you're going to have back and forth. Let the database do the serious lifting. Right? And I can't tell you how many times I've seen things like this, right? Like person.all.select p, where p.age is greater than 40. All right? um, like, <laughs> I hope you don't have a lot of people in your database if this is what you're doing, um, because you won't have a lot of users on your site if you do. Uh, this will just be incredibly slow. And this is obviously a trivial, silly example. Um, but I've, first of all, I've seen this sort of thing. But second of all, we want to push as much as possible the database. And if you have a good database, like PostgreSQL, yay, then you even have the possibility of writing functions on the server that give you a sense of abstraction, that let you really write things at a high level, think about your data in an intelligent way, and still benefit from the execution speed that you're going to get on the server side. Speaking of databases, here's another thing I see people do all the time. They use different databases in development production. Why? Because by default, Rails uses SQLite. So they're like, oh, so in development on my machine, I'll use SQLite. But in production, I'll use Postgres. Um, that's a really bad idea, guys. Uh, you just should not do that. You're going to find that things are different. You know, SQLite is not well known for its transactional integrity or for its server-side functions or all sorts of other things. And you want them to be exactly the same and aligned as much as possible. Someone earlier was saying you should even be able to take a production dump and put it on your development machine. This is great. Ten minutes? Excellent. Um, I'll just talk faster. No. Um, so you really want the, the database to be synchronized as much as possible as a technology with what you've got on the server. Um, so really, like, remember, MySQL, Postgres, whatever you're using, if you're using a NoSQL database, they're open source, they're free, they're easy to install, the gems are easy to install, have the same thing on your development machine and your server, and believe me, life will be good. All right, now, another thing, this is perhaps a little more controversial, you know, people say, oh, you know, SQL is slow, it's hard, it's complex, all right, if I switch to NoSQL, I won't have any problems at all. All right, I've never heard someone say quite that. But definitely people have said that their problems will be reduced if they use NoSQL. Now, there are some advantages to NoSQL databases. All right? there, there really are. And granted, you know, I'm, uh, I'm an old guy who loves relational databases, and you know, I see the world through two-dimensional tables. So I, I understand. But switching technologies won't solve all of your problems. It will change the problems that you solve. And I like to think of NoSQL databases as sort of an alternative data type. So, yeah, I have the SQL database, I have a NoSQL database, I can use them for different things. But saying, I'm just going to switch whole hog, it's sort of like saying, you know, hashes, great data type. I'm going to get rid of all of my arrays and use hashes instead. Um, probably not a wise idea. Similarly, people are like, oh, I don't want to run a server, I'll just put it all in the cloud. The cloud will solve all of my problems. And then I get rainbows, right? And it's true, clouds are great in many, many ways. Um, you know, I've been using Heroku with some of my clients recently, and it's really wonderful. Like, there's no doubt about it. By the way, I know, I'm sure engineer is also good, right? Like, gotta put an equal time here. All right? But it doesn't mean that it's the only solution. It doesn't mean it's the best solution for all cases. It means it's one solution that you, be, you should be considering. And so, when I'm thinking about, should we put something in the cloud? So, my, my cloudy questions, right? So, one is, how much direct control do I want over the server? Because these servers, you know, again, my experience is with Heroku, I get control, but it's not direct control. I can't go in there and really check everything and touch everything and see everything. And that's a bit of a problem. Uh, I had something just a few weeks ago where one of my clients, like, th there was someone writing a mobile app, and he changed the HTTP headers such that when it sent the host header, it did not send a colon, okay? Try debugging that without access to the actual server. It was a little difficult until we finally pinpointed that problem because our app server on Heroku was not actually receiving the request because it wasn't going to our host. So how much control do you want? Is the cost really lower than the cost of configuring and maintaining it myself? All right? Because these cloud services, they do cost money, and they can often cost more money than if, you've only, if you only need one or two little servers, then they can cost more money than you're likely to spend either yourself or hiring someone to take care of it for you. The third question, I think one of the most important ones, is how likely am I to have to scale up at a moment's notice? 
Like, what are the odds that I'm going to get hit with a huge number of requests in a very short period of time? You know, what we used to call the slash dot effect, all right? Uh, or, or worse, right? I guess you could call the Twitter effect now, right? Like, people are all going to one particular URL, and if it's your URL, you'd better be able to handle it. And that is where these cloud services just shine beautifully, because instead of having to configure and reconfigure and put you just, you know, move the slider, and there that's magic, right? You get more, thanks. All right, long controller actions, when the controller is just sort of taking too long, all right? And this is because you're trying to do too much inside of it. So you should use rescue, you should use delay job, you should do these things to put them in the background. Okay, don't do too much in your controllers. Another thing I see people do is they don't put constraints on their database. They say, oh, I'm just gonna access my database through my Rails app. And so I don't have to worry about putting in, you know, those things like foreign keys and not nulls and even constraint checks on my database. Well, your database is probably your crown jewels. You really want to guard it well. And the odds are at some point, somewhere, sometime, someone is going to access your database not through your Rails app. And then all those validations that you wrote will be ignored 100%. So you should try to have some checking on your database as well. All right, another thing is like callbacks and filters. I see people not using these all the time. It, they're great. Callbacks allow you to really concentrate on the, the work at hand, the things at hand that are in your active record models. Then you don't have to worry about, like, you don't have to have this really, really complex logic. You can break up the complex logic into a number of different methods. And it keeps your things nice and short and reliable. Another thing is people don't, they sort of forget about the lib directory, right? This lib directory where we can put any class or module that we want. And it's great because it means not everything has to fit into MVC. Yeah, Rails is an MVC framework, and yes, we love that and everything, but you know, not everything fits in there, and we can stick our uh, domain-specific things there. Here's another fun one, modifying migrations. Migrations are great. I love migrations, right? But what happens if I modify my migration after I've already deployed it to version controller to my server? bad news, because not everyone knows that they have to roll back and roll forward and all that other stuff. So it's fine if you want to modify your migration files, but do it before you commit and before you, um, before you actually share it with other people. One, one or two more things. Oh, hello. Ah, here we go. Class variables. Class variables. There we go. Five minutes. Right. Yeah, so like when I'm teaching Ruby classes, everyone wants to know about class variables. Actually, they want to know about static variables. And I'm like, you know, it's a dynamic language. We really don't have static things. Um, but class variables are very confusing. Um, and they're not always the best thing to use unless you really, really know what you're doing. Um, and it makes the maintainability of your software a bit harder. And you can use, in many cases, not all cases, but you can use constants, you use class methods, you use an external module, you can use a model even, an active record, right? Because what happens often is people forget all the fun stuff with class variables versus class instance variables, right? So here's like, I'll even show you a little bit of code or a lot bit of code, right? Where we've got a nice little class, class appropriately called confusion, where I've got an you know, at x and an at at x, two totally different variables. They have nothing to do with one another. But wait, let's introduce a third variable at x at the instance level. Now I'm really going to confuse everyone. And believe me, people make this, these mistakes all the time because they don't understand sort of what's going on and what's the difference and how they work. Two last things, cool technology. Cool technology is very cool, but it doesn't necessarily solve the business problems people have. And using things just because they're really, really, really cool is not necessarily a good way to go. You really want to think about what you're using, make it simple, make it straightforward, make it easy. You know, use things that are proven, stable, and a little boring, you know, like me. And so, because we want the stability of the project to be the main thing here. We want it to be maintainable. Um, it's amazingly shiny and fancy and great to use new technology, but that's not going to help you if the whole thing is unmaintainable. Last main trap is not learning and improving. This is something that it's true in most technologies, but I think it's especially true in the Ruby world and the Rails world. You've got to always keep learning. There's no excuse for not learning because there's so many ways to learn. You know, we've got podcasts, we've got newsletters, we've got blogs. Some of you might even remember books, these physical things printed on dead trees. You can learn other languages. Like, you know, there, there are things that we can always be doing to expand our horizons and learn, and it all comes back and it helps us when we're working. It's rare for me to learn something new and then not be able to apply it in work that I'm doing with a client within a week or two. And one last bonus trap 
is you're really having problems if you're not enjoying yourself. Right? Like Ruby and Rails are supposed to make programming fun. And if you're not having fun doing this, you might be in the wrong business or using the wrong language or framework. Um, really remember, again, Ruby is optimized for programmer happiness. Um, so if you're, an, look at me, I'm a happy person, right? That's because I use Ruby. Um, and so everyone here basically should hopefully be enjoying themselves, be able to work with Ruby and Rails, and turn out lots of great software. Thanks a lot, and I'll be happy to answer questions if we have time.